that is still uh, only 1% of the total energy being emitted. And uh, the over 99% of energies actually being carried away, uh, produced in such a collapse event, uh, is carried away by neutrinos. And so Kirk and Spinova, you can consider it as like the universe, the nature's strongest neutrino emitter. And uh, in terms of the uh, occurrence frequency, uh, roughly every second, there's one quarter supernova going to happen uh, in the whole universe, uh, in the visible universe. And uh, the rate in our local Milky Way was estimated to be roughly like 0.5 to 2 per century. Okay. All right, so what is the physical mechanism driving supernovae? It is, can be basically summarized in the one plot like this. Yeah? So initially, you have a progenitor star uh, with a central iron core that is becoming like a degenerate um, electron like basically electrons and the, the iron core size is about a few uh, thousand kilometers and the core density and uh, temperature are indicated here and the mass you know that the, for such a system supported by electron degeneracy pressure there's a maximum energy that can be a uh, maximum mass that can be supported then be the Chandrasekha mass okay, which is about one tenfold solar mass okay so once um uh, there, there could be further accretion or there could be other mechanisms that uh, somehow um, kind of um, decrease the electron degeneracy pressure, then the whole core will go become gravitationally unstable and then collapse until further forces stop it. And then that is this process uh, done by this, sorry, it could be used by this line. Yeah. <laughs> so it will go through a collapse and then become a proto-neutron star. Okay, and then you can immediately see that the final stage of the photon neutron star is something with a radius of about uh, 10 to 50 kilometers. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you can estimate how much radiational energy should have been uh, converted into other types of energy. And that gives you something like 10 to 53 lengths showing the middle of the plot. And then all those energies will eventually be mostly carried away by roughly 10 to 58 numbers of neutrinos in the time scale of 10 seconds. And those neutrinos are produced by all those different processes shown in the bottom left of the, 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 the slide. All right, so um, we these are not just the theory. Yeah, so the supernova neutrinos that has actually been once were once detected uh, more than thirty years ago in the event of 1987A, and at that time our neutrino detectors are not as big as what we have now. So at that point, uh, even if the supernova happens relatively uh, close, at uh, roughly 50 km parsec away from uh, the Earth, uh, we only managed to detect around 20 events of electromagnetic neutrino flare. Okay. However, based on those 20 events, you um, the Reconstructing or the fitted the um, neutrino luminosity and the energy energies uh, given there are consistent with the broadly consistent with the supernova theory prediction. Okay, and uh, if there's a supernova that happens today um, or over a, over the next decade, then we expect that we will be able to see now that is, then we expect that we will be able to see roughly more than a few thousands up to say ten thousand. Uh, event, neutrino event in all different detectors and in all flavors. So that will provide us um, much more information than what we had more than 30 years ago. All right, so the rest of the talk will be focused on physics and physics. Yeah. So um, why do we think that we can use the supernova related observation to constrain um, in the young standard model physics models? And that is because we know we mentioned that most in the traditional picture, assuming it's the model only, that all the energies are basically created by neutrinos. That is because neutrinos is the weakly, the most weakly indicting particle in the model. Okay. However, if you imagine that there are the other model particles that interact with baryons or known leptons or photons, uh, even weaker than neutrinos, then they can escape faster or easier relative to neutrinos. Okay, so that means that they might be able to, instead of neutrinos carrying away all the gravitational binding energies, those kind of weakly interacting particles, if they exist, they might be able to uh, carry most of the gravitational binding energy, the energy source. Okay, so in that sense, so if your weakly interacting particle carries more energy than neutrinos, then you wouldn't be able to have so much energy carried by neutrinos. And then we have already learned that we 
uh, in the previous slide, we have already learned that we know what are roughly amount of energy created by neutrinos, and then we know the emission time scale is roughly 10 seconds. So that tells us that uh, you can use that to constrain the amount of energy carried away by any new particles. Okay, so this is a famous Raphael criteria given here that the energy luminosity carried away by any new particles that may possibly be produced in the supernova explosion has to be smaller than roughly the neutrino luminosity, which is roughly three times 10 to 15 Earths per second. Okay. And this has been um, was proposed um, at like 19, shortly after 1987, and uh, um, has been applied to many potential uh, BSL particles since. All right, so then let's look at quite a few of them. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the KD SRI neutrinos, and uh, um, they are like the hypothetically um, new spe neutrino species or new neutrino flavors that is beyond the known three kinds of um, active neutrinos. Yeah, and uh, the motivation is that the uh, one motivation is um, if they can they exist, and if they slightly max um, with active neutrinos, then they might be the warm dark matter candidates. Okay, so that was proposed early on. And uh, there were also some observational anomalies or hints, or uh, probably not calling evidence anyway, that some <laughs> observations uh, a few years ago in 2014, particularly, um, they see some X rays, X ray excess in 3.5 keV lines uh, from the center of some um, both galaxies. And uh, one interpretation was that it may be produced by the radiative decay of sterile neutrinos of mass of roughly 7 keV, okay, which is indicated uh, uh, in this yellow star shown here. All right. And there was a mixing angle of roughly psi squared to theta of 10 to the minus 10. Okay. So um, if those kind of sterile neutrinos uh, uh, with roughly speaking this keV mass and the mixing angle uh, shown in this plot exist, then they can actually be produced quite efficiently inside a proton neutron star. Okay. So the production can be done by two different mechanisms. Uh, the third one is through the so called adiabatic flavor transformation through MSW like resonance, exactly in the same way as solar neutrino going through the solar envelope, solar density envelope of the sun. And the second one is through the scattering production uh, by the mixing, uh, immediate mixing. So, um, yeah, so, so those kind of um, production uh, has been used together with Raphael's criteria to by some people like uh, Agreda et al. Um, in 06, sorry, 2016, uh, to, to place, like they say, okay, if such kind of neutrino should exist, then the supernova Raphael's part should be able to exclude the parameter range uh, in closer by this uh, orange shed in the region, all right? However, um, what we found out uh, is that um, when people apply Raphael's bond to the cooling and use the super uh, cooling constraint to, to constrain the right neutrino, one important aspect was missing, yeah? So the aspect that was missing is that the they didn't include the feedback effect of the right neutrino production and the physical properties of the proton transfer interior. Okay, so the idea is I don't go into detail, but the idea is very simple that uh, to have a sterile neutrino production, um, they are basically produced asymmetrically uh, in the sterile neutrino and the sterile anti neutrino sector due to the existing asymmetry inside the proton neutron star. Okay, so for example, you can see uh, it's right hand side picture here. The, 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 the uh, axis is just tiny, kind of forget about it for now. And the y axis is that two lines. One is for uh, sterile anti neutrino production. The low, lower one is for sterile neutrino production. And you can see that uh, um, there's a strong asymmetry between. Okay. So if there's a strong asymmetry uh, in the sterile neutrino and the anti neutrino production to begin with, then this asymmetry will create or enhance, further enhance the asymmetry that has already existed in the proton neutron star in the active sector, okay? And then you can imagine that if you increase further the symmetry between active sector, then you are having less phase space to convert your active neutrino into sterile neutrino, okay? So this is like a self-feedback mechanism 
that will suppress large the stereo energy of production, which is shown uh, as an evolution of time uh, in this plot, for example. Yeah. So the, you can consider like this delta t equals to zero would be the stereo energy of production rate without taking into account the effect of feedback. And uh, when taking into account the effect of feedback, then you can see that the particularly for surrounding nutritional production can be suppressed by um, roughly uh, or close to a factor of 100 okay, for a given particular parameter. Okay. And uh, this just shows you the creation of the um, uh, 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 asymmetry in the new, new power neutrinal sector inside the supernova core. Yeah, so initially, the chemical potential of new power should be zero because power is very heavy. You cannot produce it. You can only produce neutrino and neutrino security. But if uh, sterile neutrino can be converted uh, from tau to S, then it will create an asymmetrically, then it will create a net um, chemical potential for new tau okay, over as time goes up. Yeah. So uh, the similar mechanism also works if you uh, consider the mixing between electron neutrinos and the sterile neutrinos. And uh, so we deal with both uh, in, this, uh, in these two papers shown there. And then we basically show that the effect can be shown uh, in, in, a, in a snapshot by, by these two plots. So the left hand side, that two lines, these blue lines, and then the, the brown lines are the constraint that we derive, assuming there's no feedback uh, from buffer response to a sterile neutrino. Okay, so you can see yeah, they are kind of similar to what you saw before. And if you include the feedback effect, then you see that the, uh, the constraint to between the mixing of electron neutrino and the star neutrino completely disappear out of this picture. So that's why you don't see a blue line. While the case for the uh, uh, mixing between tau and the star neutrino also be largely shifted to a much larger mixing angle. And so basically, they cannot be competing with um, other X ray bonds. Okay. So, yeah, so when, when by including those effects, we largely let the supernova contract with the right neutrino, basically. So then let's discuss the second object of this talk. The second thing I want to talk about is also the constraint, similar constraint that has been put up in the dark sector total by um, dark photon. Okay. So um, it was proposed um, also early on by the theorist that uh, there might be the dark sector might exist with a dark photon, kind of like parallel set of standard model photon but with a finite mass. And they can mix with tiny mixing with standard model photons. Okay, and if such kind of, and then uh, they can also have the, 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 their own interaction with the potential dark fermion uh, given by Chi. So dark photon is location is A mu. Okay. And uh, those dark photons, A prime, or the dark fermions, potentially the candidate of dark matter, Chi and Chi bar, they can also be produced. Um, Inside the photon neutron star, by a, a different number of processes, for example, by the nucleon nucleon uh, breast charlem shown here, also by the inverse complement, for example, of this process, or yeah, or they can also decay or be paired, trans, uh, created by, say, electron plus strong pair, for example. Okay, so there are a number of processes that can produce them, provided that the mass are uh, below roughly a few hundred of mega electron volts. Okay, so similar Raphael's concept has also been used to place um, um, the mixing parameter or the parameter space of the spark sector. And then, for example, if you ignore, completely ignore the degree of freedom of dark fermions by considering only the dark photon, you can say, okay, the dark fermion is too heavy, and photon uh, may be in the measurement of a few hundred megaton volt, then I don't care about dark fermion in the super wide environment. Then, uh, there are many recent works. They try to look at this problem, and then they can typically put the constraint uh, from the graphical cooling bound and the mixing angle is shown as the dark photon mass here shown as M prime in this parameter space. And you can see that it complements uh, with some other bonds, for example, like the late decay or from the stellar uh, horizontal branch charge or from other terrestrial in dump experiments. Okay, so Fill in this part of the parameter space. Okay, and uh, um, there are also other bounds that one can put, that one, one can put additional to the Raphael bound, uh, which one is what we propose last year. Uh, 
but a, a bit bigger than that, and then the other one is called the gamma ray anyway. Okay, so supernova has been considered as a useful prop or to or useful product to constrain the dark photon mixing with standard model photons. Okay. And more recently, there are a couple of works examine the potential concern uh, of sub GV light arena with supernova. Okay, and then again using a similar cooling constraint. And uh, for example, the left hand side picture shown from Chang et al. in 2018 shows that uh, once again supernova can provide a good constraint on this monitor space okay, below some um, experimental reaches. Okay. However, and the right hand side is somewhat similar. Okay. And uh, um, one thing that has been ignored is that uh, here they assume, typically they assume a relatively big um, carbon factor in the dark sector. Like for example, alpha B equals to 0.5 here. However, when they derive this plot, the self interaction between dark matter or dark fermions or dark particles were completely ignored for some reason. Okay. So uh, we tried to also working with um, a previous um, research assistant, Aidan, uh, in our group. We tried to also revisit this issue and uh, try to compute what is the self-tracking effect of dark fermions and those dark photons inside the environment okay, for some GV um, dark particles. Yeah, and those are preliminary plots. But what you can see here uh, is that, so there are two lines. So let's just look at one of them. Maybe look at the left-hand side. Yeah, so the x-axis is the dark fermion mass, and then the y-axis is the alpha D fine structure constant in the dark sector. And uh, here we assume that the dark photon mass is three times the of dark fermion, and assuming a particular mixing angle of and the minus A. And what this line shows you is that for any region above this line, there's no supernova constraint. Okay. That is simply because the alpha these are even if it's tiny, but if we just tend to the minus 10, and even down to 10 to the minus 15 of alpha D, the self tracking effect of dark matter, dark sector, will be enough to prevent any of that from leaking out. So the rubber constraint will not be able, able to be applied to dark sector, by dark sector uh, with a moderate um, self invention. Okay. Only loss having very tiny alpha D, uh, you can do supernova constraint. Okay. So, yeah, this is still, we are still trying to wrap this up. And uh, um, the same mechanism, I presume. Uh, it can also um, be applied to other stellar of bounds, um, or they can be also be interesting for generating dark matter inside the neutron star. Okay, so the third thing that uh, um, I want to talk about about supernovae is um, uh, how how can we use that? so we, we previous two ones were like uh, we raise some bound. Okay, so we are the raising the bounds <laughs> and uh, how. Whether we can use supernova to do something good uh, for concerning the DSM stuff. Yeah. All right. So, uh, one candidate that we thought of together with Sergin is that uh, um, we, we, we think that the, um, the, okay, it's related to the issue of EV steroid neutrino. Okay. So, um, if you, some of you may remember that uh, almost like 80 years ago, there was reported the anomalies from short backside reactors shown in this plot, where uh, in the baseline of, say, sub kilometers, they see a slight, um, slightly less neutrinos than expected from the anti uh, electron neutrino uh, produced by reactors. And uh, there were also earlier. Um, Earlier anomalies reported by RSMD and the recent one by Mini uh, sort of like conclusive anyway. Yeah. And then all those anomalies might be reconciled if like EV or roughly match range of EV is the right neutrino exist. Okay. And uh, we also heard this morning that uh, there's a Hubble tension. And then one proposal to solve that is you have light EV is right neutrino that are self interacting strongly among each other, then that may also. Um, help to reconcile the Hubble tension. So there are some motivation for this kind of um, strange particles. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so unlike AD steroid neutrinos, the EV steroid neutrino lay will not be produced from deep inside the proton neutron star. Okay. So the production mechanism is more that you you your proton neutron star emit the regular active neutrinos and then when active neutrinos propagate on their way out, 
uh, through the state envelope, then those active neutrinos will be can be converted into EV state line neutrino. Okay, so with supernova cooling bound, they don't do anything for EV state line neutrino. Okay. Um, however, um, so okay, so the, the question that we ask, first question we ask is we have supernova neutrino data from 1987A. Can we use that to constrain the EV star you know, I say if they are produced, then some of them may be converted on the way up. So we suppose we should see a reduction of the original flux. So this is the question that we first ask. And uh, it turns out it's difficult because we at that time we only see one neutrino flavor, and then we have very few events. And uh, we, we detect those neutrinos over the time span of 10 seconds, for which we do not know the um, very well, even without any exotic basics, yeah, even for active study. Active neutrino itself, we cannot predict the reality the arrival flux. So the next question that we want to ask uh, is can we roll it out when the next galactic supernova occurs? Okay. So um, this part, uh, I sorry that I have four panels here. <laughs> yeah, but um, basically what this part shows is um, the left hand side the normal mass neutrino ordering, right hand side is for the inverted neutrino mass ordering, and then uh, the top ones are the flavor. Conversion probability of uh, uh, the flavor survival probability for an electron neutrino remaining as an electron neutrino, and the lower ones are the flavor conversion probability of an electron neutrino going to a new or tau neutrino flavor. Okay, and from what you can see here, that and then the, the x and the y axis are the emitting parameter of these EV star neutrinos. Okay. So from, from what you see here is that uh, independent of which mass ordering. Um, you will see that uh, over a wide parameter space, you don't see that yeah, this conversion probability is like zero. Okay, so that means that uh, whatever your electron neutrino initial uh, had it initially, they will all be always converted to sterile neutrinos. Okay, so that's a um, bottom line of this plot. So they will be yeah carried as a sterile neutrino. Okay, so then judging go ahead and calculate it. Uh, all those um, predicted event or expected event for a galactic supernova at uh, 10 kiloparsec uh, for a uh, different type of detectors, including DIN, Hyper K, and the Juno. Okay, and then um, we only consider folks on the very short time window, the first 10 milliseconds of a supernova event. That is because that is the only phase which we know understand the oscillation phases better. So um, within that order 10 millisecond, um, we can still, the neutrino detector will, we expect them to still detect a sizable number of events. Yeah. And uh, for the case of standard non sterile neutrino mixing, then those total event numbers are given by here, the very top line. Okay. And then if you use some different um, mixing parameter sets, then you can see that for the case of normal ordering, on the thin, the events in the thin is roughly comparable, only slightly reduced. Well, the events in the tiger K can be reduced by roughly a factor of three ish, okay, similarly for Juno. Okay, so with this reduction of detected event, then the gene can go ahead and then construct a chi square and then draw the exclusion limit. And then this is shown on the left hand side, for example. Yeah, so the red, red line is work. And so everything on the right hand side, if there's a next galactic supernova on the times, then all these parameter space well, can be excluded by the supernova neutrino detection. Okay. And uh, uh, the right hand side just shows you the sensitivity. And the bottom line is that uh, uh, for any neutrino, a uh, heavy type of supernova that happens within our Milky Way, up to a few times of um, kiloparsec, you will be able to confidently draw out a sterile neutrino sitting in this uh, parameter range. So how much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay. All right, so five minutes to go through the cosmic ray related stuff, um, um, which is largely motivated by SMIN uh, sitting here, and uh, mostly done by the numerical work, and uh, most of the work are done by Gangu, who was a postdoc in my institute, and now is in China. Okay. 
So the motivation was again back to dark matter that the, um, we want to search for dark matter, and uh, however the, search, the dark matter searches for um, super GV ones, heavier than GV ones, is so far um, see uh, no results, <laughs> no signals, and maybe one possibility, but uh, yeah, we don't know yet. Anyway, so this partly motivated the consideration of all other candidates with different masses of detections. Right. And it was proposed um, in 2018 by Brilliant et al. and AMIO that if you assume there's a scattering, um, there is an interaction cross section between dark matter and nuclear, then the existence of cosmic array that propagates in the interstellar medium or in the Milky Way halo or in the intergalactic space, the same interaction will be able to uh, accelerate a bit of dark matter sitting there. Okay. So similarly, just like a, um, so in a sense that we know in the center model particle center, we have those non-thermal spectrum that are like a power law. And then if there are any potential interaction between the model particle that have this power law, that they have this dark matter particle, which are sort of uh, visualized uh, in anywhere, then they could generate also a subcomponent having a power law in dark matter, okay, not thermal dark matter uh, component. All right, so then we, so that was done by those two works. And what's new in our work uh, is that those works they consider Mainly the dark matter um, being generated uh, or being upscaled to an energy range of roughly a few um, around GeV each. Okay, so where you can use the existing like neutrino detector or the low energy experiment to set constraint on those upscaled dark matter component. Uh, however, uh, what Gang thought of was that uh, hey, we have the ice cube detector that is capable to detect. Um, the particles having, say, roughly PEV ish of energy. So we know cosmic ray has energy extending out to EV. So, how about that we have a look at uh, how much dark, dark matter can be upscaled to the energy range that ice cube can prop? Okay. So, what he does is then basically follow what simulate done uh, before. We just assume that uh, there's a um, cosmic ray uniformly distributed uh, Milky Way by a flat size of disk. And then we assume that we take a few different dark matter profiles, and uh, uh, we assume that even dark matter nuclear interaction cross section, and then we can just use the simple formula to calculate how much dark matter can be accelerated. Okay, so this part this part shows you the results like uh, on those um, red line and the black line are the upscaled dark matter flux in this energy range. Uh -huh. For two different dark matter masses, uh, the, the, the upper ones for one keV, from the lower ones for one mb, and uh, in comparison, also shown uh, like the actual physical neutrino being detected by ice cube, fitted by power law, shown by this this um, orange line, okay, and the cosmic ray, primary cosmic ray spectrum multiplied by ten to the minus two. Okay, so you can see that uh, for a cross section that is roughly like ten to the thirty at this energy range. Uh, centimeter square, the upscale the dark matter component of flux can be comparable to that of astrophysical neutrinos. So this immediately tells you that ice cube will be able to prop the dark matter cross section at this energy range that is roughly like a bit roughly comparable to the neutrino proton uh, cross section. Okay, because their flux are comparable. All right, so then using those similar methods and then just scan over different dark matter quantum space, then you can also draw a good uh, distribution plot as shown in here. So yeah, so uh, forget about the extra galactic component. So for just, just, let's just get the galactic component here. Then you can see that um, this constraint that derived by considering scatter the high energy dark matter component ice cube can confidently uh, can robustly sort of robustly uh, exclude the sub GV dark matter with cross section roughly ranging in between 10 to the minus 32 to 10 to the minus 28 ish. Okay. And uh, the neutrino proton scattering cross section in this energy range is sitting roughly somewhere here, a few times to 10 to the minus 34. So as expected, yeah, this constraint can be put uh, close to the neutrino uh, proton uh, scattering connection. 
And uh, one question that we often been asked is how does this constraint uh, being compared with low energy scale? Because this cross section is determined by high energy scale. So to do that, you need to do extrapolation or you need to have a good model. Okay. So if we do a very simple naive extrapolation, assuming that cross section just goes proportional to e to the alpha where alpha is a power law, then you can basically just shift the, the right constraint to somewhere down there. However, uh, we should more recently realize that uh, um, yeah, this is just a very naive. So what we do is that we consider a particular model, a gun consider a particular model, um, where you just consider the interaction between dark matter particles with standard model parts of the runs um, with the uh, exchange of a uh, vector particle. Okay. And uh, with that, then we also consider the potential generation of the inelastic signal because you can imagine if a dark cosmic coming in with a such a energy applied with a dark matter particle, you can easily exceed the threshold production for delta resonance. So then you can produce also high energy photon and the high energy secondary neutrinos. So all those are, I don't have to go to detail in with, but I can look at a paper here. So those are the predicted uh, um, high energy gamma array and the neutrino flux um, shown there. And uh, unfortunately, uh, when we consider such a kind of model, which is primarily the differential cross section is located at low Q square, then uh, our new proposed concern cannot compete mostly with the uh, low energy uh, experiment, like a Z91 type, for example. Yeah, that is simply because of the differential cross section dependence. However, this is so we look at this like an example that well, if you have some kind of infection type that can that is not so um, relatively enhanced in the low energy Q square, then this kind of constraint might be interesting. But we didn't go further to pursue that. So I think I run out of time. So I will just leave my summary page here and then thank you for your attention. This moment has used up all his time, so we maybe allow one or two urgent questions. Anyone? Okay. You just okay. So since the probability of uh, testing this uh, BSM particles depends on the amount of neutrino that we that we can observe. So does this capability largely depend on the distance of the supernova or not? Okay, so there are a few questions, right? So the first one is, the, for, for example, for the case of ED star neutrino, uh, that we really need to have a future supernova, and then the total event that we will determine is how good we can produce what the, 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 the constraint. So in that sense, it's depending on that in the case. Okay. And what uh, we show is that uh, well, as far as up to say 20, 30 KDC, we can do the good similar bounds. And then for the case of Raphael constraint, um, that is independent of that, that the concern has been no, that we could test now no, we because we had the past event of that in the yes. So in a sense, for that, if you, if you just simply apply Raphael's function, no. then it is independent of any newcoming supernova explosions. But if, if you say you want to further use that if the next supernova happens, then of course that will be the depends on the distance. Okay. Okay. When you talk about the sterile neutrino feedback, would this bring it back? Into the double equilibrium and the chemical signal. Uh, so, if I understand correctly, yeah. So, there, there can be still radiation producing a bigger layer, and then they may be, uh, so some electron or tau neutrino can be producing a bigger layer, and then they may, they may be transformed back to an active flavor in outer layer. And then that would in fact change the temperature of some supernova matter around that layer. Yeah. So basically, it's an energy transfer process it's from inside the outside, that is forbidden by the cinema model particle. And then one of the work we took it out the total time, and the temperature variation uh, was roughly around like two ish. Yeah. You can answer uh, so these questions. Yes, yes. The questions. Yeah. Uh, in the first question, can one yeah do similar axis to axion? Uh, I think so. Yeah. So, <laughs> like uh, some people actually, quite a number of people actually do it. And uh, um, yeah. So to, to to repeat that work, then we need to find a even better motivation because some of was already done by even recently by Lirici at all. The first one. Yeah. Uh, 
and uh, well, if you have a model that has a self copying in whatever sector you have, like the axiom, then our new 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 erasing the bound can be applied to that. I would say so. And then I have several reference value of can all this Oh, okay. Uh, probably not. So only some of the listed values can be used to explain the show based baseline anomaly. Uh, what do we what, what we mean by generating that table is just to see over which range of the parameter space um, the E D Stoyani channel might be grow up. Yeah, so we try to do it independently from the EV several uh, short base short the kind of baseline anomaly. I hope I answered your question Okay, let's thank the uh, second for this nice talk. Uh, our second lucky speaker is from local, uh, Khan, uh, from here. He will talk about 3D supernova simulation. Uh, yeah. 